So the uh, topic today is long-range strike in a contested environment. Uh, that contested environment uh, part of this is actually the uh, major driver for long-range strike. Uh, the uh, anti-access and area denial uh, game has really ramped up in the past few years, and frankly, that ramp is likely to steepen in the coming decade. Of course, the first contested environment that uh, LRS will face is the uh, environment that uh, DOD and the administration and Congress is facing with uh, sequestration and all of the other uh, competing priorities. And it is important that we get that fight won first. I'd like to introduce the panel members before we get uh, going here, and I'll introduce them in order that they're uh, speaking. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Rebecca Grant has a PhD from the uh, London School of Economics and International Relations. Uh, she's worked for uh, RAND uh, with the Office of the uh, Chief and the Secretary. Uh, she's a regular contributor to Air Force Magazine uh, and uh, has written extensively on uh, the case for a stealth bomber. By the way, she has herself uh, orientation flights in the uh, B-52 and the B-2, and I just want to make it clear for the record here today that uh, although she uh, flew those flights as a journalist, she has never claimed to have been uh, shot down by enemy fire uh, on either of those flights. <clears throat> Next will be uh, Lieutenant General Retired Chris Miller. Uh, Chris is an Academy grad, Rhodes Scholar, uh, has commanded uh, B-1 Ops Group uh, at uh, Dias and the B-2 Wing at Whiteman. Uh, he's uh, also commanded the uh, 455th Air Expeditionary Wing at uh, Bagram, uh, retired as the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Programs at the Pentagon. He is now a Distinguished Grad Scholar at the Air Force Academy's Center for Character and Leadership Development. And a uh, little bit of uh, trivia here is that uh, he and I were in the same Boy Scout troop and have known each other for 44 years. <laughs> Lieutenant General Bob Elder, uh, retired, has an engineering doctorate from the University of Detroit. He commanded the uh, B-52 Ops Group and then the wing at uh, Minot. He's been CENTAF commander, commandant of the Air War College, 8th Air Force Commander, and in that role, of course, was also Commander of the uh, U.S. STRATCOM's Global Strike Component. In that role, uh, he maintained currency in the B-52, but also flew in the B-1 and B-2. He's now a research professor with George uh, Mason University. Uh, it was uh, my honor to be his Deputy OG at Minot, and he plays one mean set of drums. <laughs> Colonel retired uh, Mark Gonzo Gunzinger, Air Force Academy graduate, flew B-52s at uh, Minot, Castle, and Guam. Uh, he has uh, supported every post-Cold War defense review, uh, either uh, as an Air Force officer or uh, including being an SES, worked for OSD in the National Security Council, has uh, co-authored five defense planning guidances or uh, guidance for development of forces, and uh, has been the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Forces Transformation and Resources. He's now a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. As in uh, many of these panels, uh, the least impressive person was voted the uh, panel chair. And uh, so my uh, background is B-52s uh, operationally, a little bit of time on the uh, requirements uh, staff for the uh, B-2, uh, some uh, flight test in uh, uh, the B-52 and uh, commanding flight test for all those airplanes and a little bit of uh, research and development at the uh, Air Force Research Lab. There should be slides coming up. There we go. So this is what we're going to talk about today. These are the four questions, and the first one is spe very specific in the way that it is written. And uh, that is, it does not ask the question, why do we need the LRS? Because to ask that question is to start talking among friends about all those reasons that you know we need the LRS. The most important question is, do we need the LRS? Now, we may believe we know the answer to that, but understand that the going in point of this is that there are plenty of influential people out there who would suggest that it's either too expensive, especially given sequestration, or that it's not a priority given all the other things out there, not just in the Air Force, but in the other services, uh, or that it, even that it is not necessarily 
required in today's environment of fighting insurgent wars, that there's a low likelihood of major power uh, strategic combat, uh, that we have rise of other cloud uh, uh, combat cloud fighter capabilities, and so on, that simply make this irrelevant. So we need to ask the question, do we need the LRS, and be able to explain that to somebody who is asking it from that point of view. Then if we do need it, of course, why? And you have to be able to answer that question to answer the first one, but you need to start with the basic assumption that the people you're talking with do not get it. Then we need to be able to explain why do we need a new LRS as opposed to simply uh, not, why don't we just use and upgrade our current platforms? And we need to be able to articulate this to the public. The Air Force needs to be able to articulate this to the public. Second, what capabilities must it have? Uh, certainly a payload, range, stealth. Those things may seem obvious, but if you're reading uh, lately, you'll notice that uh, people in the uh, highest uh, echelons of the Navy are asking the question about whether stealth is continuing to be relevant. Uh, there are other issues such as uh, interoperability with other platforms, command and control, uh, what are both the offensive capabilities required as well as the defensive? And then what adaptability should the platform have for evolving into the future? Third, how should it be deployed and employed? And the first question that needs to be asked in terms of force structure is, how many do we need? And why do we need that number? Because I will tell you that this number will be attacked and rectal extraction, boys and girls, is not a strategy. We've got to have our act together, and it ought to be a pure understanding of why we need the numbers we're asking for. Uh, but there are other issues uh, in terms of force structure. Uh, where do you deploy them? Uh, what are the uh, basing considerations, both uh, within the uh, CONUS and overseas? Uh, are there new tactics for this new platform? And then a fourth, is the political and economic uh, view considerations. DOD and Congress will each have varying viewpoints. We need to figure out what does it take to make this happen? How do we explain this to them? Who do we need to get to? And uh, what can, should, and must we be ready to give up, perhaps, in order to make this happen? And then finally, when do we need it? And what kinds of flexibility can we have? Okay, to start this uh, discussion out, uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Grant. Thank you. I just have to say it's, a, it's an honor for me to be up here this morning with uh, this group here of uh, people with such great bomber experience. Um, I've been very privileged to, uh, to have just a little bit of acquaintance with this field, and I'm glad to be here with you gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, looking for a slide here. Great. I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about the business case for long-range strike. First of all, we have a pretty clear demand signal, not only from decades of operations and from current planning and current operations, but we have a clear demand signal within our national strategy. The defense guidance back in January of 2012 specifically called out the need for a new stealth bomber, and we know why it's needed. It's to do that job summed up in the bullet. To be able to be persistent against a heavily defended target set anywhere in the world. We also know, as this picture symbolizes, that our fleet today is a noble fleet, but it's not enough. It's not what we need for the future. In some scenarios, in many ways, we really are down to this last group, this last 20 B2s augmented, of course, by our B-52s and B-1s. But this is a fleet that needs to go forward. It needs to add a new bomber as well. Is industry ready? I couldn't hear you. Is industry ready? Oh, you're not allowed to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> 
Is industry ready? Resounding question, yes. It's true, we haven't developed a new bomber, designed one, uh, in over 30 years. But take a look at this chart, which gives you one primary optic. It looks at basically the decline in manned fighter bomber production. So not only from the business case of our major national strategic requirement, but in looking at our defense industrial base, developing new technologies in long-range strike is an indispensable way to invigorate and sustain our key engineering talent. The good news is that it's not as though industry has been doing nothing in these last few decades. As we look to revitalize long-range strike with new platforms, new technologies, we will be building on a legacy of other aircraft, whether these are unmanned aircraft, whether we're looking at F-22, F-35, the many programs that have seriously advanced the state of the art for long-range strike. So the answer here is it's more than time. Industry is more than ready to go and do this and to build us something that is new and better and advances. Now what's essential, of course, is that this is also part of maintaining our defense technology edge, so rightly called out recently by our Pentagon leadership as now a vital task within our national strategy. But also essential is swift execution of this program. We've seen what happens when that doesn't work out, so let's keep in mind that swift execution on the business side is essential as well. What about costs? Kurt talked about the contested environment, and that contested environment isn't just the threat environment, it's the environment around Washington as well, as we look at what our priorities are. Let's keep a few things in mind symbolized here in this chart. One is that even looking at the FY 2016 requests, uh, long-range strike is not the most expensive technology that we're requesting for. I just picked a few categories here, not including major acquisitions, but looking at some other systems that show that in comparable dollars, this is something we can well afford. I like what the Navy has done in looking at its Ohio-class replacement program, known as SSBNX. They have called it out specifically as a special program within the shipbuilding accounts. In fact, even separating it from their main shipbuilding because of its unique importance in maintaining our strategic deterrent. The Ohio-class replacement SSBNX will do something that no other ship class does. Similarly, a new long-range strike system will do something that nothing else does. Let's remember how special it is and judge our cost context accordingly. Finally, are we ready? Well, what about the market forces? More than ready, I would say. The two pictures on the, the left side of the chart look at Targets of yesterday, one, of course, the famous Novi Sad Bridge, finally and definitively struck by a B-2 after other weapon systems had not accomplished the destruction required. And then another SA-3 th site thrown in. But the target set of yesterday, for which we are able to work with a relatively small bomber fleet, has now changed immensely. As Chief of Staff General Welsh says, God forbid if the war comes, we will be dealing with a much different target set. The Missions of the future will be shaped by more robust defenses, by a different target set, by a much larger target set. We need a long-range strike fleet that's able to cope with what we see symbolized in the pictures on the right as well. So, more than ready, more than time to move forward. And now, on to our next panelists. Thank you. Like the rest of my colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here and to, and to talk with you a little bit about something that I think is important to our nation and certainly to our Air Force. Um, you're going to have to suffer through a little bit of a, of a history major's uh, <coughs> perspective on things. This is exactly what Kurt Bedke referred to. It's what Rebecca implied. Uh, and it's not new because that's from our first Secretary of Defense back in 1947. Uh, this is an issue, how much long-range strike we have, what it needs to do, uh, how capable it, it must be, and how much it costs in perspective. Uh, it's an issue that's been around for a long time because it's a big program and it's an important, and it's an important one. I'm going to talk just a little bit about how we got here. And a lot of airmen don't realize how much our current, and I use the word legacy on purpose, uh, force has done over the years and how flexible it has been. 
uh, everything from nuclear deterrence ops, uh, General Wilson's here, General Herensack's here, those folks know that day in and day out the bomber fleet sitting on the ramps at uh, Dias, Minot, Whiteman uh, does a nuclear deterrence mission that is unique. Uh, but it also does CAS, and I remember well being in the first crowd of uh, B-1 folks at McConnell when we had nothing but nuclear weapons and sitting out the Gulf War all the way to sitting at Bagram and watching B-1s be requested, followed, tracked, and cared about by my Army colleagues doing CAS in Afghanistan. So the flexibility of the system cannot be overstated. It's been pretty robust, too. B-52s dropped uh, or flew 124,000 sorties in Vietnam, uh, all the way to the single-digit uh, single sorties that, that happened in places like uh, Libya, uh, Serbia, other places already made the point about uh, conventional conflict and we can't forget that the LRS business case includes the fact that it presents that long-range strike capability writ large presents the president with options that the SLBM force and the ICBM force simply cannot by their nature uh, it allows some escalation control it allows signaling you can go back in history and see how we have used it uh, B-2s over Korea make a statement that folks in, uh, in a silo in the northern part of the U.S. simply cannot, and neither can a sub. Uh, so it's qualitatively different, the long-range strike capability that we have had as an Air Force for our entire existence. And it is a superpower attribute, and that cannot be, uh, it can't be quantified, but it also can't be understated. We've invested a lot over the years, 700-ish B-52s, 100 B-1s, 20 B-2s. We've deterred nuclear war and played a, a key role in conventional conflict with that force. But that existing force is aging, and so we need to talk a little bit about what it takes to sustain excellence, one of our Air Force core values, in the long-range strike business, which is a superpower uh, capability and our national effectiveness. This is kind of a funny chart. Dr. Grant and I collaborated on it about a quarter of a century ago. And what it said was, with the B-52 using standoff, we could still hit uh, medium to, to some high threat targets. With uh, direct attack, we could go after the, the low threat targets. And you can see that the B-2 at that time, we assessed to have capability against all three types of, of threat environments. Uh, the B-1 had but was losing the capability to go against the, the, uh, the most highly defended threats. At that time, one of the debates that raged, and it still does, is direct attack versus standoff. And I'd refer you to a RAND study back uh, about five years ago that said if we use a long-range strike platform, the nominal long-range strike platform, for about 20 days of direct attack over a 30-year history, we will prop to strike the same target set that we could strike with uh, standoff weapons. We'll probably come out ahead. We could have a long debate about what those numbers exactly mean and what the assumptions that went into them are, uh, like, like any uh, numeric debate. But the point is, direct attack is useful, has been useful. Uh, presence in the battle space allows you to, to collect data that no affordable standoff weapon probably can. And so that in and of itself is a case for sustaining a, uh, a persistent capability to do direct strike. Not to mention the low end conflict where the platform by, by nature simply has volume and capacity and range to deal with the threat. But that was then. What we're facing now is a much more difficult threat environment where Stealth, I would argue, has gone from being a trump card to being the price of admission against any, any enemy with reasonable capacity. And when you look at this chart, we tend to think of large nations that may be peer competitors as the, as the anti-access threat, and that's not the case. Uh, air defense, uh, target hardening and burial, all of those kinds of things are where our adversaries put them. And if you think about the fact that an LRS capability we start procuring now will be in play until somewhere in the 2050, 2060 timeframe at least, it is very difficult for us to imagine all of the things that we could have to fight our way into with a long-range strike platform. 
So I would disagree respectfully with, uh, with our colleagues in the Navy. Uh, I don't think we can afford to build any, ca any airborne capability without stealth in the future. Increased processing power, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, it helps the enemy, it helps us. And the kill chain is what matters. Okay, so I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about how we get the capabilities right. First of all, as the Air Force said, as the SecDef said when he announced the decision in 2011, the long-range strike platform has to be conceived in a family of systems. You can define your family however you want to. I would argue it includes our air refueling capability, it includes our C4 architecture, it includes our fighter and, uh, and other airborne platforms with which the LRS must be capable at some point of networking. But we cannot design it to be the Death Star. It has got to be conceived as part of a system of systems. We have got to get the right initial parameters correct. We could have a debate about exactly what the range needs to be. If I, if I knew the number, if I still knew the number, I'd have to tell you I don't. But it has to be a long enough range so that as our adversaries mature their delivery capabilities and the destructiveness of their weapons, and I'd remind you that, that we ourselves had a debate 20 years ago about neutron weapons, or actually a little longer than 20 years ago. Our adversaries have a very, very high probability of developing weapons that we really do not want to deploy forces into in the early stages of a war. So we have to, with air refueling capability and, uh, and the bases that we would have available, be able to strike targets that matter. We have to do it with weapons that have effect, and so that will drive decisions on the size of the weapon bay, the types of the weapons that go with the system. We have to design it for maintainability, and we have to be able to take cost out of the lifetime of the system, because without that, the, uh, the folks who would critique the Air Force and the Department of Defense for spending money we don't have and don't need to spend uh, have, a, have a pretty strong argument for life cycle cost. We have to plan for stable development over time. Dr. Grant and I in the early 90s went out and looked at the B-2 uh, assembly line. We planned to build 132 of them, then we were cut to 75, then we were cut to 20. We facilitized for 36 a year, and so that assembly line had far, far more capacity that we all paid for, and our kids are probably still paying for, than it needed. So equally important with speed of procurement is stability of procurement. We have got to decide what the platform uh, will, will look like, and then we have to produce it in a way that is stable enough to be affordable. And I know uh, uh, Lieutenant General Mike Holmes was in the, in the audience at one point. Uh, it's an easy job to fit all this into the budget. But I'd go back to reinforcing what Dr. Grant said, which is we have to put the cost of the LRS in perspective. The nation in five years, uh, between 07 and 12, spent almost $45 billion procuring 40,000 MRAPs. Uh, in terms of long-term contribution to national security, I'm not sure what that got us. There's no doubt that it saved American lives, and those are hugely important. But in context, an LRS program from 50 to 80 billion dollars uh, is not, uh, it's not out of the question. But in order to afford it in every year's budget, which is all that really matters, uh, what we can afford in a given year, what Congress will appropriate in a given year, uh, we have got to be stable. And we've got to articulate the consequences of failure. That is, at some point, our 20 B-2s, which are too few to really be flexible the way we need them to, will not be able to get to targets that they need to strike. We will not have the ability to influence some outcomes with kinetic power if we do not procure this system. And that's a big deal for the United States of America. So we have a responsibility to kind of turn Lenin and some of the other uh, uh, theoreticians about quantity and quality on his head. Quality, as in a long-range strike platform that has the ability to, to tangle with the toughest defenses at range, that is something that has a, uh, a quantity all its own, and we need to get in that direction. And I'll get off the stage and turn it over to General Elder. Well, like my fellow panelists, it's great to be here with you today. And uh, my part here is to talk a little bit about employment. And 
course, there's a limit to what we can do in talking about the em employment of the airplane, but I would really like to stimulate some thinking of your own. And one of the things that's always impressed me about airmen is that uh, we've always been known as great innovators. And if you leave the room today and you feel innovative, then I feel like I was very successful in the, in the presentation. So I'd like to have a bottom line up front. We used to do that when I was working in the AOC. And that way, you look at the, uh, the bottom line and you said, I don't think I want to see the rest of the briefing, then you can get up. So this is what I plan on talking about today. So if you don't like it, this is your chance to get up and uh, walk out. But what I, what I want to talk about from an employment standpoint is kind of a broad range of employment. And I'm going to say that first line you see there, it gives the nation a shaping, influence, and operational effects capability that is unmatched by anything else. And that's, that's true of our current bomber force, but it'll be even more true in the future with this new platform. It's going to encourage restraint among our adversaries. It's going to be part of how the U.S. can promote regional stability around the globe. It's going to enable us to do things as we've done with Libya or, in fact, even uh, the initial operations in Afghanistan where you enable uh, indigenous forces to be successful. And it's going to, the fact that you have this manned aircraft means it's going to be very adaptive because we can do a lot of things with our computers, but when we talk about this innovation, you can't beat that. And the, the family of systems piece of this thing, which General Miller already pointed out, this is, this whole notion of family systems is very important because this platform will enable a lot of other platforms to be much more effective. And when I hear people say that they, that they don't think that they would need stealth in the future, you know, one of the things that I need to point out is that not all stealth is equal. So the fact that you put a little uh, 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 stealth material on a platform to perhaps reduce how it looks on the front end, that's a lot different than what you're going to see with a, a long-range strike bomber. Uh, even with the B-2 in terms of this all-aspect stealth. It uh, makes a big difference. So that's what I'm going to try to hit today. So first of all, I said we're innovative. We're airmen. Uh, we exist as a service because the nation needed innovative approaches to solve some difficult problems, particularly at the end of World War II. And so not only is the LRSB and the family systems innovative, but it's going to encourage more innovation. And for our national command authorities, what it does is it provides some what you might call strategic alternatives. And what that means is that this airplane is going to enable the president to have a, a tool not only of military power but of diplomatic power. In some cases, it, it's going to be able to be a, an economic uh, aspect as well. So we look at what a joint force commander does with this. You know, we, if you think about it, and you think of the different ways that our bombers have been employed recently, it really does enable the entire joint force to operate more effectively. And so I think you're going to see it used that way. And of course, it's going to continue to be part of that joint fight, and you're going to see it uh, supporting terrestrial forces and making them safer and hopefully providing that kind of force protection we've done. But it's going to be a great, uh, as General Deptula uh, talks about all the time, it's going to be a phenomenal sensor platform as well. So when we talk about this, you know, we always talk about the joint operation. I, I like to always bring this slide out. It's right out of joint doctrine, and it talks about unified action. And all I want to remind you is that when we think about how you're going to employ this family of systems, this long-range strike, it's not going to be only part of the joint fight. It's going to be a huge part of the joint fight, but it's going to be part of this enabling, you know, what we typically refer to as the dime or the whole of government. And I have some examples there. I don't want to go through those. But if you think about how bombers in the past have been used to support this, you're going to continue to see that done. And then where I show this uh, coalition, this is kind of this enabling operation. You think about what happened in Afghanistan where, the, uh, where basically they took a bunch of tribes, you put them together, and then they were able to defeat a uh, organized force largely because of long-range air power making that difference. I think you're going to continue to see that, and this platform is going to allow us to do it in ways that we couldn't do before. And then we don't think about this that frequently, but it, it, uh, it has a huge maritime element as well. They use the B-52s for this all the time. It's a, it's a great force enhancement capability in terms of maritime operations. And, and you can imagine that in some of the contested environments that we're now starting to see in a maritime environment, having a platform that is able to reach out and enable us to do maritime operations, particularly if we're thinking about protection of our own homeland, it's going to be 
most likely used in that way as well. But one other thing is uh, the, what we typically think when we think about long-range strike is this ability to go in and hit this, this deep target with a, kind of a, a single weapon. But when we talk about uh, a long-range strike bomber, we're really talking about this idea of persistent long-range strike. And this chart that's here comes out of its old doctrine where they, where they had the, um, uh, the, the different campaign phases, but it's a good way to lay this thing out. And when you think about how you're going to use the long-range strike bomber, the bottom line is it's going to be used across every phase, but it's going to be particularly important, as it turns out, in this early, these shaping phases. But it's also going to be that key platform that's going to enable that, that joint fight. So the fact that you're able to operate persistently in a contested environment with this platform is going to change the way that we do a lot of operations. It's going to be a big part of our nuclear employment as well. And the fact that you have not only stealth, but you have standoff capability and you have electronic support capabilities is going to enable us to do things in this environment or in the nuclear uh, uh, deterrence, strategic deterrence, that we have not really been able to do before. Now, although the LRSB is going to be initially conventional, all the press announcements say that it will ultimately be uh, certified for nuclear. and so. It's going to be a, a huge part of the strategic deterrence force. When we think about strategic deterrence, I want to foot stomp that for our allies, it provides an extended deterrence. And we, you know, if you talk to Air Force Global Strike Command, it's a deterrence and assurance. So this assurance piece is going to be very important because it can signal. You can't signal with a lot of our other nuclear capabilities. In fact, you don't signal with submarines for sure because it gives away where they're at. So the one other piece that we don't like to talk about that much, but you know, if you ever had an adversary that you thought could do something that would make any of our ballistic missile based parts of the triad ineffective, there's no point in even trying to do that because even if they did, we still would have a nuclear capability. So it's a great hedge against that. And I always like to point out to people, it's got some pretty good counting rules unless they change that. But right now, one bomber counts for, for one weapon and, and we've been known to put more than one weapon on the airplane. When we talk about how you employ this thing in peacetime, I just have this list here. I'm obviously not going to read this list to you, but everything that you do with a bomber every day is going to be part of this overall shaping activity. And just look at that list. All the things that you do with a bomber every day, that is assuring our allies and it's having an effect on our competitors. So the quick summary that I get off the stage to leave this with you is that the bomber is going to, this long-range strike bomber, it's going to be the foundation of the way that airmen innovate in the future. It's going to allow us to do uh, support our national security, support our joint force commanders. It's going to be able to support our terrestrial commanders as well. And this, this platform is going to uh, enable innovative airmen to provide alternatives that will, will be of great benefit to the nation and to uh, our, our partners around the world. So thanks for letting me join you today. Well, thank you for the invitation to address you today, and I uh, appreciate your comments, and I'd like to build on them somewhat. Uh, I have a hard topic to talk about, you know, the political wars. How do we prevail to explain to Congress why it's important that we maintain a uh, very viable long-range strike force in the future? Uh, I think the first thing I would say is we can't talk to Congress. We can't talk to the American people the way we talk to ourselves. You have to tell a story that uh, starts with, well, what is the threat? And I can't talk about everything in the 30 seconds the panel has given me to, uh, to talk about this. So I, I kind of picked out three questions. These are the questions I'm most frequently asked on the Hill. Uh, by the media, by other people in DUD. So what is a threat? And we're already buying lots of fighters, so why do we need to buy bombers too? And how is the Air Force going to pay for it? What is it, it going to give up? Well, let's talk about the threat. Let's start at the strategic level and take a look at um, the world that we are moving into. It's very different than the what we've thought about in way of threats uh, over the last 25 years since the end of the, uh, of the Cold War. We've got three revisionist states and they have some shared characteristics. They seek to gain uh, a great deal of influence in their regions. 
They're developing those anti-axis air denial capabilities and strategies to prevent us and other foreign uh, powers from intervening in their regions. They're improving their ability to project power, not just to deny, but to project at least regionally. And they're putting a lot of resources into those new technologies to create the asymmetric capabilities that will, again, prevent us from projecting power effectively to assure, to deter, and if necessary, to uh, uh, defeat. Let's take a look at China. I'm not saying we're going to buy the next bomber because of China, but I can't drill down into each one of those uh, revisionist states. Let's just take a look at, uh, at the Pacific. It's transitioning from a continental force to a maritime power. It is investing a lot of money into strike capabilities that are pretty precise, that can attack our bases in Japan, in South Korea, and as far out as Guam. And they're going to continue to extend the range that they can strike at, and the numbers they can uh, throw at our bases, at our installations, at our forces are growing as well. In fact, I think the main threat to our bases in the Pacific is not so much the ballistic missile threat, but it's the cruise missiles, which they can uh, really bring in numbers to suppress our operational tempo. Next part of the story, well, okay, well, we could always drop, drop back to bases that are a little more distant, such as Guam, such as uh, northern Austria, and, and use long-range strike capabilities to stay out of the densest part of the threat ring from, uh, from China, uh, out of the range of their short-range and medium-range ballistic missiles and most of their, uh, uh, their cruise missiles. So that's true, but there are some big distances involved, which drives a need for more long-range capabilities not just with range, but also persistence once they arrive in the operational area and with sufficient payload to do something when they're in the operational area. Every feeling, of course, will help. It'll help us with the range problem that we have in this kind of a, uh, a scenario. But let's remember the anti-axis air denial threats of China, Iran, certainly Russia, um, are investing in, or in the case of Iran, uh, continue to seek, will prevent us from doing that close-in airy feeling that we've uh, become accustomed to in a couple of wars in Iraq and, uh, and, of course, in Afghanistan. So that will hinder our ability to persist forward, uh, especially for a force that is biased towards short-range capabilities. We also have a challenge of strategic depth. Now, once we get there, we have to understand the potential target areas are probably much, much larger than what we've become accustomed to in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, that uh, geographic mass or uh, population sizes don't translate directly into the size of the target base. That's true. But you still have to be able to penetrate over long ranges through some pretty potent air defenses to attack target sets that may be frankly, much larger than what we've attacked in the past, uh, that may be more mobile, hardened, deeply buried, much more challenging target sets than what we've become accustomed to. And of course, these targets are defended by weapon systems that are effective against our aircraft and, for that matter, our weapons, individual PGMs. So that does drive a need not just for a long-range strike, long range, persistence, but also the right kinds and numbers of payloads in the future. So against that kind of a backdrop, starting with where might we need to operate in the future against kinds of threats and considering the target base and distances involved, how is our, how is our current force uh, suited to, uh, to supporting those operations? Well, the fact is we've got a, a force today that's much, much smaller. And our long-range strike force is, uh, well, you see the ratios. It's um, uh, a fraction of what we used to have as a nation to project power over long ranges in the past. We now have 96 operational bombers, of which we have 20 B-2s. I think 18 or 19 of them are, are combat-coded. Now, that is half of the operational bomber force that the bottom-up review in 1993 said our nation needed uh, in the Cold War era. So that's, uh, that's pretty significant. So moving to the next question, how is the Air Force going to pay, not just for the LRSB, but 
to create a better balance of short and long range uh, uh, capabilities, ISR, strike, as well as other missions that uh, uh, long range capabilities could uh, perform. Well, there's some good news. Uh, frankly, the Air Force has figured out how it's going to afford 100 uh, LRSBs under a full sequester. And you see the latest budget submission did plus up the, uh, uh, the Air Force's budget by you know, quite a bit, 16 billion. But there's another side to the story. The Air Force blue budget did increase, but it's still about 22.8% of the uh, DOD's base budget compared to the Don's 30%, the Army's 23%. So the Air Force is still in lag. And it's true that the Air Force has increased what it's going to spend in FY16 to procure new aircraft. However, Navy continues to spend quite a bit too. In fact, it's still a little bit above what the Air Force is planning to spend, but the good news there is at least this year they're going to put a little bit more into buying ships than aircraft. Now, I'm not saying to be able to afford the LRSB we need to go after the Navy. That's not the point. The real point is we say we are joint in everything we do. No, we're not. We're not joint when it comes to programming. We still look at it uh, through a stovepipe. Services develop individual budgets. They're provided with a target uh, upfront, uh, fiscal guidance upfront in the, uh, the program development phase. And frankly, that's, uh, that's an antiquated way of looking at future capabilities and how we can support the kinds of priorities that we need as a nation. So we're into the questions, but I want to make the last point very clear. It's not about how is the Air Force going to pay for the bomber? How is, what is the Air Force going to give up? We need to look at it from a joint perspective, from a DOD perspective, and make the right kinds of trade-offs across the force. Similarly, fighters. We can't approach, well, how, how many fighters does the Air Force need? How many fighters does the DOD need? How, do we have the right balance across all three uh, military, or all three services, Marine Corps, Navy, and uh, Air Force? Do we have the right balance of long range and short range capabilities, not just for the Air Force, but for the Navy as well? Uh, frankly, I had the benefit of taking a look at a lot of the questions that are piled up here, and almost every question has to do with are we going to be able to use our bases? Are we going to be able to conduct air refueling the way we have in the past? How are we going to afford it? The kinds of questions that I just addressed. So in closing, I'll say we, as current Air Force, retired Air Force, uh, or Air Force uh, uh, supporters, need to be able to tell this kind of a story to our senior policymakers so we can get the kinds of resources we need to build the uh, force structure that our nation needs in the future. We've got uh, 15 really good questions up here in about five minutes, so I'll hit just a couple of them. Uh, first uh, question, it seems that our current force structure relies on assumptions about access to basing that are no longer valid under China's A2AD. Do you believe the Air Force has the right mix of forces, bombers and fighters, to address current and future security challenges? I'll take that one. No. Next question. Okay, anybody want to elaborate on that? I guess I would say no. that the issue is not what are the numbers. The issue is what are the capabilities and how are those capabilities being degraded uh, with the uh, threat and how do we c come up with something that is the right mix that will be able to address the threat that we're facing today and 10, 20, 30 years from now. Anybody want to add anything? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add one thing. Um, I didn't, didn't want anyone to walk away thinking I'm saying we as a nation ought to pay for the bomber by buying fewer fighters. If you caught it from that, uh, that one graph I showed, we have cut our, our fighter forces significantly. I think we're headed toward a uh, future fighter force that's going to be barely sufficient. The problem is we don't have enough of those longer range, higher persistent uh, capabilities 
And uh, that's where I think shifting more of our resources uh, toward those capabilities would create a better, a better mix. Great. Next question, what are the complementary capabilities which need to be developed along with an LRSB? Uh, for instance, is there value in pursuing weapons to allow penetration of high threat areas because we won't have a lot of LRSBs? You want to take that one? Rebecca? Now, oddly enough, um, yes, of course. So the complementary capabilities are critical. What we need then is an LRSB that will let us develop those over time, as my other panelists have pointed out. Complementary capabilities, weapons, yes. Uh, electronic warfare, yes. Directed energy in the future, yes. Carry on. Okay. Uh, one that uh, a lot of people uh, ask the question of, and I'm going to throw this one probably out to uh, Gonzo first, and that is, can long-range strike be unmanned? And if so, when and how? Yes, absolutely can be. Uh, but when? That's, that's the key. Uh, I've long been an advocate of unmanned long-range strike capabilities. Now take a look at the uh, Navy's ongoing debate over a U-class. Uh, I'm a fan of a UCAS, I'm a combat air system that can fly off a deck that could have now two, three times the range of a, uh, a manned fighter. That would give the Navy a real advantage in the future, for not just for strike, but for ISR and other missions that aircraft might, uh, might provide. The same for the Air Force, but it's not a question of should we go for an all unmanned strike force, long range strike force? No, it's going to be a mix uh, because I think there's some synergies between those high endurance unmanned platforms and manned systems that might be uh, battle controllers in contested areas. Uh, together, they will give us much more persistence in forward areas and frankly increase the, uh, the payloads that we can bring to the fight as well. I'd just add one thing to that, and that is, yes, it can certainly be unmanned, but the question we need to answer is why? If doing that makes it better at doing something that people on board can't do, for example, in 2040, if we've got an unmanned long-range strike platform that we're willing to use to provide on-demand casts, and it can orbit for 48 hours at a time, that would be wonderful. But the idea that we would take a $500 million platform and take two, three, four people out of it simply to avoid risk is ridiculous. There are people in this room who have strapped themselves into airplanes for years and years, and we ask our, uh, our brothers and sisters and the other services to go into harm's way. So it's not a matter of avoiding risk to air crew. It's a matter of what can the nation do better with an unmanned platform. And when that answer uh, makes sense, then we can and should do it. But that's a growth capability that needs to be built in and not an assumption that needs to come from, uh, from on high. Great. I was given uh, one last question that is, when will the Air Force put out a comprehensive justification for LRSB? I'm going to hand that one over to the Air Force. I think uh, we are currently uh, in this point uh, in the acquisition process where we're sort of in the calm, but the storm is coming. And we should use this time now to be thinking about the answers to those questions so that we are all.